This 8-bit console here is the Master System. This was Sega's direct competitor to the vastly more popular Nintendo Entertainment System, and well, kind of flew under the radar unless you lived in Europe or Brazil, where it had quite a bit more popularity. Well, this one here was kindly donated to the channel by Eric Castro Diaz, also known as Hungry Bartender. I don't know about you, but I'll probably need a drink after working on this console. And that's because, well, it doesn't turn on. So we need to figure out what's going on and how to fix it. And on top of that, it's in a sorry state. So let's see if we can not only get this bad boy working, but also give it a little TLC to make it look as close to new as we can. Now this year, I am planning to restore a few more consoles like this PC Engine shuttle, as it's something I really enjoy doing. There's just something about taking an old beat up console and giving it a little love to make it work again. So I do hope you enjoy these videos because I really enjoy making them. Anyway, let's get back to the Sega Master System and see if we can get this thing back up and running. Okay, so not surprisingly, we gotta tear down this Master System, and what I absolutely love about these older consoles is that it's a very straightforward process. Just a few screws hold the top and bottom together, and before you know it, we're inside the console. Now, as we're tearing this down, I wanna quickly explain what I think is causing the power issue. So there are essentially three areas I wanna look at. First is the power jack, which connects to the power supply. I wanna see if it has a cracked or bad solder joint, since that's an area that gets exposed to a lot of external stress from repeated inserting and removal of the power cable. Next is the power switch, which could simply be faulty. That would be a pretty bad scenario since I would most likely need to pull a working switch from another Master System console. Not something I wanna do. And lastly, I wanna check the voltage regulator, which I'm kind of betting is the culprit. I've read online that in many instances, people sometimes use the wrong AC adapter on these consoles, which will cause the voltage regulator to fail. So that will definitely be something we're gonna look into. And don't worry, I'll walk you through step-by-step step how I'm gonna check everything out. Okay, now taking a look at the motherboard, it looks to be in overall pretty good condition. And taking a closer look at the power port, the solder joints look pretty solid. Now I went ahead and removed the heatsink, which in hindsight was completely unnecessary. So definitely recommend not removing it just yet. So in order to diagnose the power issue we're having, we'll need to use a multimeter. I have mine already set up, and now I'm gonna plug the console into power. I've set my multimeter to measure DC voltage, and one thing to keep in mind is that this is a live circuit, so please exercise caution and proceed at your own risk. With that disclaimer out of the way, let's first check to see if we're getting power in through the connector by contacting our red positive probe to power and the black one to ground. The master system takes a nine volt power supply, and that's exactly what we're seeing coming in through the console, so everything looks good so far. Next, let's see if we're getting power to the switch. This point here is connected to power, so we should see nine volts here also. And we do. So we know that power is getting to the switch, which is a good thing. And this point here is the other side of the switch. Since the switch is off, we should not see nine volts here because the switch is not bridging these two points together when it's turned off. Great, so we're not seeing nine volts since again, the console is switched off. But if we turn the console on and measure again, we should see nine volts because the switch is now completing the circuit. Awesome, so we see nine volts here, which means the switch is in good working condition, which leaves the last thing I wanna take a look at and hope is the issue, the voltage regulator. These three points here represent the three legs of the voltage regulator. We have the input leg, which accepts the nine volts when the console is turned on. We have ground here in the center, and this is the output leg, which essentially sends power to the rest of the console. So with the console still on, we should see nine volts here in the input leg, meaning nine volts is coming into the voltage regulator. 
And we do, so that's good. Now the voltage regulator steps down that nine volts coming in and should output five volts here in the output leg. And boom, there's the issue. Instead of five volts, I'm seeing like 0.467, which essentially means the voltage regulator is toast and is likely what is causing the console to not turn on. So it needs to be replaced. So now we need to go ahead and remove the non-functioning voltage regulator. Thankfully, I have another 7805 voltage regulator that I was able to pull from a junk model 2 Sega Genesis, as it's a pretty common part that several consoles use. Now all I have to do is pop in this new one into the master system and see if it works. All right, so again, we're gonna check out the output leg of the voltage regulator to see if we're getting five volts with the new one. But before we do that, let's quickly talk about the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. If you have an idea for a new mod or want to assemble an open source project, PCBWay provides you with the tools to make them a reality. From 3D printing services in an array of materials, all the way to other services like CNC machining, injection molding, and of course, PCB and flex ribbon fabrication. So when it comes to taking your retro mods to the next level, PCBWay is the place to make that happen. Check out the link in the description for PCBWay to get $5 off your first order. And again, a huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. All right, so back to checking the voltage regulator. Let's see if it's working like it should. Okay, so it looks like we're getting nine volts in, so that's good. And awesome. We are indeed getting 4.92 volts, which is basically five volts, but that should mean the console will now turn on. And as you can see, when we flip the switch, the green power LED illuminates. It wasn't doing that before. All that's left to do is to plug it into the TV and see if we actually get a picture. Awesome, looks like everything is working. Just wanna see if the pause and reset button work and it appears that they are fully functional. And even the controller works. So I think it's safe to say that we completely fixed this Sega Master System, which is fantastic. But we're not stopping there. I'm also gonna replace all the electrolytic capacitors since they're all likely pushing over 35 years of age. So let's go ahead and do that. After removing all the caps, let's toss the board into the ultrasonic cleaner to give it a deep clean. Honestly, the ultrasonic cleaner is one of the best investments that I've made, and I now pretty much use it on all the consoles that I repair and refurbish. It's a great tool to have, and I honestly can't recommend it enough. Now after the ultrasonic cleaning, I like to give the board a bath in isopropyl alcohol. This helps to displace all the water in all the crevices and hard to reach areas. And since isopropyl alcohol evaporates a lot faster than water, I can ensure that all moisture is removed from the board, which is what you want. And then I just quickly hit the board with my electronic air blower, which is another very useful tool that I use all the time. Now I figure since we're in the cleaning mood, I'll also tackle the outer shell and other bits and give them a bath real quick since they're also pretty grimy. Just some warm water, dish soap, a toothbrush, and a bit of elbow grease is all that it takes to remove years of dirt and grime. All right, with the shell and everything clean, I'll go ahead and set them aside to dry while we bring our attention back to the motherboard and install our brand new electrolytic capacitors.
Great, with the fresh caps in, let's bring our attention back to the voltage regulator. In my particular revision of the master system, I have this really strange heatsink which makes the voltage regulator pretty inaccessible. So that being the case, I need to remove it again and install it onto the heatsink first. So let's do that. Now when installing the voltage regulator to the heatsink, we need to first apply some thermal paste. So let's first clean off the old paste from the heatsink and then apply some new thermal paste to the back of the voltage regulator. I put a bit too much here, but that shouldn't be an issue. Now we can go ahead and install the voltage regulator. Be sure to align the three legs with the three holes on the motherboard. And before soldering it in place, I'd recommend first securing the heatsink to the motherboard with the two screws. And now we can finally solder in the voltage regulator for the last time. It's really interesting, but it looks like the protective film on this panel has never been removed. Or at least I think it's supposed to be removable because man, it was actually really hard to take off in one piece. I'm guessing that over the years, the adhesive just formed a stronger bond to the panel surface. Anyway, I was able to remove it and yeah, the surface below is pretty immaculate. So I'm guessing the original owner just never thought to remove it. Now, the next thing I want to address is the white residue on the cartridge slot. I just used some IPA to break it down and it eventually all came off. I think this must've been paint or something because it was pretty stubborn, but thankfully it came off cleanly. And the last thing I want to address before putting it all back together is the red plastic panel here, which you can see is pretty scratched up. I'm just going to hit it with some Novus plastic polishing compound, starting with level three and then working my way down to level two. It won't get all the scratches out, but it should look a bit better once I'm done. And there we have it. Not perfect, but definitely a bit better than it was before. Now, all that's left to do is to put everything back together. And to cap off the restoration, as usual, I like to apply some Aerospace 303 plastic protectant to the outer shell, as this not only conditions the plastic, but it also provides a layer of UV protection and gives off a really nice matte sheen finish. It even hides some of the smaller scratches and blemishes. And there you have it, folks. A completely repaired, cleaned, and refurbished Sega Master System console that is ready for decades more of enjoyment. I'm just so happy with how this turned out. Thankfully, we were able to diagnose and fix the power issue with the Sega Master System and get it looking a bit better than how I received it. While it's not in pristine condition, I know that electrically, it's in tip-top shape, ready for many more years of enjoyment. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, I'd really appreciate you hitting that like button. 
Also, check out the video recommended on screen for some other great modding and reefer videos that I'm sure you'll like. As always, thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I'll catch you again next time.